Hello, welcome to Microsoft Community Podcast, where we share insights from community experts to stay up to date in, in, in Microsoft. I'm Nicholas and I'll be your host today. In this podcast, we'll dive into Pulumin Azure. But before we get started, I would remind you to follow us on social media so you never miss an episode. So you help us wish more amazing people like yourself. Today, we have a special guest called Alec Harrison. Uh, could you please introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. I'm Alec Harrison. I am a Microsoft MVP in AI and Azure. I'm located in the US in Omaha, Nebraska. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Welcome. So since our session is called Polymi, could you give us some like, explain what's Polymi and how is it used? Yeah, for sure. So Pulumi is an alternative for infrastructure as code in the cloud. Um, the most applicable thing it would be equivalent to or similar to is probably Terraform. I think a lot of people have heard and used that product. Um, Pulumi is kind of similar to that, except it allows you to write your infrastructure as code in the language of which you choose. So think of like uh, AWS has their CDK where you can do like TypeScript, all sorts of languages. Pulumi does that as well, but it's cloud agnostic. So whether you're in AWS, Azure, GCP, um, you can go ahead and write your Pulumi file to go to any cloud of your choice. Okay. So why would someone choose to use Pulumi in the environment instead of like Terraform or Bicep? Mm -hmm. So I think Terraform scared a lot of people away when they first made their biggest change uh, in their terms of service and the open tofu fork happened. So that was when they changed their terms of service, the billing model maybe looked like it could potentially change. Uh, the community decided, hey, we're gonna fork the open source repo and we'll manually keep that up to date. Uh, that's a lot of overhead and a lot of pain, uh, particularly like somebody has to go out and do that and keep it up to date. While the tech is being widely used, that's not a big issue, but you're then not getting for first party support, right? You're getting the somebody's taking the fork and updating it manually. The other thing is uh, HashiCorp or Terraform was recently purchased by IBM. I don't think there's been any major changes right now, but uh, as far as I can tell, like IBM owns them now, they could totally change how the system works or how the technology works. Um, so I think that's another reason why I'd potentially choose it. Instead of using like your primary cloud providers ones, like uh, you have Bicep, ARM, CDK, CloudFormation. Um, instead of that, if you're running multi-cloud or want the potential of, you know, having a single source of truth, while like you still have to write basically an if statement to say if Azure do this, else do this for AWS, uh, you can still write it in one language or one technology suite, right? So you could share scripts, you can share them around, and that would be for if you don't want to be just in the proprietary languages. So say, I don't know, maybe my product has a requirement. I want to be multi-cloud. If I'm trying to use the first party support tools like CDK and Bicep, I would have probably two separate scripts that have two separate deployment processes that you might be able to have status checks in your pipeline, but it's not going to be the same deployment process to both, right? So I would have to say, hey, go deploy to AWS, go deploy to Azure. Where if you do it in a tool like Pulumi, Terraform similar to, you can say, hey, here's my script for both clouds. Go deploy it. It's the same deployment process, and you could roll back uh, as you see fit. Pulumi and Terraform 2 also both have state files. So you can kind of see uh, what the state is of your cloud and hopefully try uh, to get yeah, a little sorry. bit more monitor drift as well. So if your resources are drifting, you can kind of get some alerts with that as okay. well. Because I know that. Terraform have their own like SDK as well mm -hmm. than Plumi. Yeah, they have their own SDK and like CLI that you can roll in and use. Uh, Plumi also has Plumi AI, which is new and kind of cool. We can show that off too. Um, but yeah. Okay, cool. Can you give us some like use cases that we can use Plumi that you've in like for like environments in Azure, how do you can spin up infrastructure? Yeah, so I can kind of 
let's go ahead and I can show my screen here and we can just start with the UI. I'm, I do right now I'm using Pulumi more as just like for personal use. So nothing too crazy is going yeah. on. Here. Just so you know, um, we have kind of different projects so we can create a new project. I should have, uh, you can ask like what you want the project to be. So they have a few templates, so you can go ahead and hit the ground running. There's different stacks here. So these are kind of similar to an AWS stack. Uh, right here is the GitHub repo that I'm building on right now. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, and this is not a knock on Plumy, it's a knock on like infrastructure as code where we are today. I'm trying to deploy through infrastructure as code a Llama 2 model on a consumption-based plan in AI Studio. And a lot of Microsoft's APIs to do that right now are in preview. So it's hard to find documentation yeah. on how to do that. So that's what I'm trying to do just as for fun. I can see my resources here. So it also gives you an easier experience to see across basically everything, every resource in Plumi that's been deployed. So you can see uh, I was doing some of these quick start things about a year ago. I touched some of these two months ago and some of these two days or 16 days yeah. ago. So uh, could you zoom in a little bit? Alex? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's do that. Uh, we can also download it to a CSV. Uh, if I had the enterprise one, I am on the free tier, so I don't pay anything for this. This portal kind of comes with it. Uh, but there's some extra enterprise features if you want to be paying for it. We also can look at environments. So I could potentially spin up multiple environments, kind of like what you were talking about there. We can watch them. You can store some secrets here. Uh, you can also store secrets in AWS or your uh, deployment pipeline as well. So you kind of have uh, different options available to you. So whether you want to do it in an experience like here, do it in Key Vault, do it in your pipeline through like a app settings file or something like that. There's a ton of different ways, oh, so the yeah. world's kind of your oyster. Yeah, because this is quite similar to Terraform Cloud. It's on the cloud mm -hmm. version. Correct. Yeah, I would say it's fairly similar. You can go ahead and do a lot of that. Uh, some of their stuff, I've not used Terraform Cloud. A lot of places I work at, they kind of just use Terraform as the bare bones, so they don't really go to the cloud yeah. version or the enterprise version. That costs money. But from what I've seen, it looks fairly similar. Can you do you know whether you can run this on prem? Or is it just uh, only in the cloud? I to deploy on prem resources, you're saying? No, I mean to have the own Plumi like the under URL on prem. So like they have if you want if clients want to secure it. Um that's a good question. I don't it know just if I know it's like Azure. It's just public access to everyone. I think it's public, but you can put policies in place. Okay. But I don't know if you can host like this dashboard on prem. I would have to look into uh, that. Okay. All right. Like I, I've used it for fun for personal stuff, so I haven't gone quite that yeah. far. Of <laughs> I want to deploy this on prem and secure it. Um. Here's our deployments. If we do get environments, so a deployment links to an environment and a stack, uh, we can put policies in place. So the same way that you have policies in Azure and governance in Azure, we could do it here as well. Um, but you do need to upgrade to do that. You can also get SCIM integrations, audit log, all that other stuff. So if you're like SOC compliant or need to be audited, you can put other tools in here too. Uh, and then there's just other if you want to do open id connect you can do that so you can connect for sso uh, there's other integrations here too so uh, whether you want to use the github app or any of these other tools octopus deploy gitlab circle ci whatever your you know pipeline of choices it shows you how to connect to those yeah. um, i'm using there's GitHub a free version of Plumia, right oh yes paid correct this is free okay so you don't pay for any of this. Any of the features I'm showing you that I have are free because I don't pay for Pollute Me. Okay. Uh, and then these are the how you can set up your first initial workflow. It walks you through that. 
And I think this is the coolest part of Pulumi, and we'll show you on Pulumi AI, but you can do this in any language you want. Um, granted, this is for a GitHub action, so you do have to write your actions, obviously, in YAML. There's slight different uh, configurations depending on what you're going to put your project in. So let's talk about getting started, kind of what that looks like. Typically, you'll go through a starter project. There's a before you begin, just making sure you have Pulumi installed on your runner of choice. Um, and then creating the project. I'm using C Sharp, so it's walking me through the C Sharp stuff. It just remembers I did that. Uh, this one is trying to make me do the AWS project. I could go down to Azure, get started. The get started is still the same thing, but they, as you can see, they just have a different sample project for that. Uh, you can do YAML, Java, C Sharp, Go, Python, TypeScript. All of those are supported. Uh, so it's really cool if you want to just hop in. And if you're a company that's trying to do, for example, like full stack developers, it might be an easier pill to swallow when you ask them, hey, to do you know, their own infrastructure because it's, hey, we'll give you the pipeline, right? Because the pipeline at the end of the day is fairly simple if you have a basic like three-tier application, right? It's just, okay, we're going to have a database, we'll have a UI, and we'll have a back end. Uh, you can go ahead and build that simple pipeline of just like, okay, here's where the project needs to be for the front end, here's where it needs to be the back end, blah, blah, blah. The infrastructure piece is nice though because then it's, hey, you don't need to learn, for example, YAML if you're an app dev team, right? I could be a .NET dev. I'm going to hop in here and I'm going to feel comfortable because, hey, it's already in C Sharp. Or if I'm a front end dev and I like TypeScript, I can jump in here and use TypeScript. So there's a lot of these pre-canned projects to get you started. But then also, I don't feel like I'm weird or, you know, stepping into some sort of new technology that I have to learn for my job because... Maybe I'm slinging C-sharp code all day, every day, or TypeScript code every day. I can hop in and just be ready to go. Uh, the other thing that's kind of cool is a lot of people like Python for scripting. So even if you're early in your career, maybe want to get into DevOps. So maybe you're super early and like you've done a bunch of Python scripting or a bunch of Python CRUD apps. Here's an easy way for you to get into infrastructure code and DevOps potentially because, hey, you don't even have to learn a new language. You're just learning the DevOps like methodologies or thought process, right? You've already learned Python, the language. Now we're going to expand it to a new methodology of continuous integration and continuous deploy. It can help push you in that direction. Um, one thing I will call out is Pulumi Up is like their version of their tech conference. It's a free conference. Anybody can register. Uh, this sounds like I'm sponsored. I am not sponsored by them. So you can go ahead and sign up. It's a free, I think, all day event on September 18th. They got all their speakers and whatnot. Okay. If you want to learn more about yeah. it or see how people are using it, it's a fun event that just happens to be nearby this time. But I'd recommend checking do it out. Do you know whether I cool do use Plume? Do you know whether you can use Plume with Azure DevOps and GitHub Actions? I think um, you can. let's check Azure DevOps. Yeah, I think there's a cap action. Yeah. Yep. So PS2. if you hit this, it'll walk you through on how to use it. It looks like there's a task extension for Azure pipelines. And then it'll walk you through. Yeah, how you I guess the out. only difference is like, I guess the only difference is the, is the pricing compared to Terraform that's free open source, but you just have to use it with Python or like other job over scripting language as well. But the Pulumi is the cost involved when you just have one tool. Yeah, and uh, Pulumi is also open source. So I don't think they have Terraform. I could be misremembering, but I think Terraform, especially now has like a private version and an open source version uh, where the open source version is now, I think being maintained by the community. Uh, you can actually go out and if we go to GitHub, you can see the Pulumi. Oh, I don't want it in that org. All of Pulumi's stuff is out here open source. You can go and copy it and run your own if you want. Uh, but it's all out here. So you shouldn't be, if you're worried about something, you know, 
going away, you could theoretically just take it and run your own if you really wanted to. I wouldn't recommend that, but it's all out here, open source. They even welcome community contributions too. So if there's something you just don't like or want fixed, uh, you can also go out and fix it yourself, which is kind of cool. Uh, they have a very active Slack channel too. I will we'll give a shout out to the people there. I've asked some dumb questions and they usually are very nice and answer them and don't make me feel like an idiot, which <laughs> is great for a tech community because sometimes all people will do is tell you to read the manual and just send you a little blurb. So that's been fun as well. Um, the other thing is, so say like you've kind of got your idea of what you want to build. We've talked about how there's some project templates here. Maybe I don't want to use that. They have also recently rolled out uh, Pulumi AI. So I can come in here and say, all right, let's do C sharp and say, I want to host an API on an app service. And with, let's do a SQL server static web app the front end I guess I probably should have told that I'm in Azure but it was able to figure that out based on the way I was talking about resources and whatnot And there we go. So if you look here, this is the Plumi file to do basically everything I asked it to. Uh, it by default tries to do subscription level uh, infrastructure as code. So if you do want it to create resource groups for you, for example, you will have to give it that subscription level contribution role. You can make it not do that if you don't want to. You just then when you do the deployment for Plumi in the CLI command or in your pipeline, you just tell it what resource group to throw it in. And then here's my storage account. The storage account will be for the static website. Um, throwing that in there. SQL server. We'll do that because we want a SQL server that we said. Uh, we could set a password. We could also tell it that we want to use maybe managed identities. We could see what that looks like. Uh, here's the database on the server itself. Our app service plan our web app on our app service plan. So this is the app service, uh, the front end, and then this dictionary outputs the stuff at the end. Oh, okay. so that we can connect. Yeah, I saw that you can connect to it using REST API as well. So you can use it probably through VS Code. Yeah, they have some extensions in VS Code too that you can use. So if you want help with uh, like snippets or connect it there as well. Uh, they have a uh, the whole CLI command, so you could even run it through uh, the VS Code terminal. Uh, they also have a validate command that they do before you try to deploy anything, kind of like Terraform and Azure has it too. I believe AWS yeah. too, does too. So you don't have to um, deploy everything out before you see if your template's even valid or not, which is cool. Uh, and then they have the feedback of, was this uh, helpful? We can also hit the deploy with Pulumi button. And I believe that actually tries to help you. So say I, I like this template and I hit that, it'll help me create the project and actually get it deployed. So we can install the GitHub app or authorize this to use GitHub and it'll spin up a repo and stick that template I just created in there, which is kind of cool. Okay, yeah. that's quite nice. It's fun and then you can tweak it. Um, with all things AI, I've seen this with uh, GitHub Copilot. Sometimes it's not always 100% correct because Plumi has built theirs. I found it a little bit better than um, GitHub Copilot. I was trying to use to deploy some CDK stuff, and I would get a lot of infinite loops of, it would say, here's how you deploy this resource. And I would say, hey, Amazon said that's invalid or that's an old way to do it. And be like, oh, you're right. Here's another way. So, you know, we got option one and then give me option two. And then be like, hey, option two still doesn't work. And it'd be like, you're right, here you go. And then give me back option one. And then I'd be stuck in this infinite loop of, it'd be like, try this, try this. And we just go back and forth forever. Mm. I haven't seen that in I'm Plumi as much. Know. 
Go yeah. ahead. I'm curious to know how many modules to explain we have for the AI. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they'll talk about it at their uh, conference. Because at the moment, I think, say, on, on the bottom of it, the panel, it said GPT 4.0. That's the one that you're on. But I don't know if you can switch different modules. Yeah, it doesn't really, it doesn't really seem like it. So maybe that's something fixed yeah. on their end of, maybe they're using rag behind the scenes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that that's fine. So let's let's talk about a little bit of AI at the moment. So how are how are you using AI, Gen Gen AI and AI overall? Are you using it at work or are you just using it in spare time? Yeah. So I'm actually helping a company right now. Uh, it's about a $2 billion manufacturing company. And we are working on building out some Gen AI use cases for them. So we have one that we're hoping yeah. to go to production here within the month, uh, which is kind of helping some end users with their questions. Um, I don't yeah. know if I can demo that specifically, but what it does essentially is somebody can ask a question and then it pings all of their internal documentation and tries to answer it because they also have a traditional call center. So what it's trying to do is make the first person that um, that bot essentially right that, hey, here's the answer quickly. And then we're also providing citations. So the experience is very similar to I don't know if you've used Google lately. Um, how to use GitHub Copilot. Let's do that. Okay, that's not going to do it. Um, what I was trying to show you is the Gemini model from sometimes will pop up here and try to answer your question. It's very similar okay. experience to that that we've built where we'll say, hey, here's what we think the answer is. Here's the citations that we go think go along with that so that they then can click links like you would in Google. So like maybe they don't trust our AI answer. They can go ahead and click here and see more data, whether it's their yeah. own internal, you know, PDFs, their own internal documents, their own internal what have you. Um, so okay, it's kind of working. So it's only for internal use. Yes. Is it only for internal use, like document search and stuff? Okay. Is it like a? Is it on production or is it just normally like a proof of concept? Uh, we are in the process of deploying it to a small subset of users, so. I think when you talk Gen AI, there's two big fears right now. It's security yeah. and it's cost. Uh, I think security wise, the company I'm at is fairly confident that they feel like security is okay because we're using all Azure products. So uh, Azure, you know, keeps all of your data within your specific subscription. They don't use it to go back to the models to train it. It just stays where it is, right? So security wise, they feel really confident that Microsoft and Azure has their back there. The biggest thing they're concerned about is cost. So I think we've proven with different POCs that we think it's accurate enough to be put in front of end users uh, because worst case scenario, they still call the call center. So we still have that backup, that uh, escape route, if you will. Um, and then best case scenario, they get their answer and they're off. So that leaves cost. And right now we just don't know kind of how well people will use it or how uh, much people will use it. Uh, one thing I will call out yeah. is with Azure OpenAI GPT 4.0 Mini. The cost for AI has pretty drastically dropped. So this is per thousand tokens. But I guess you can just yeah but i guess you can just customize it on what you want but you just have to keep testing it's like uh, whatever you want searching document only and limit it yeah and we've we've locked it down too there's a configuration in the api to say basically only use my data i've provided you so that should help yeah. cut down on hallucinations hopefully because then you can't you know, for example, go find an answer on the internet that's completely wrong or off base or not applicable to our company. Uh, that's so that's how we kind of solve that one is just say you don't know if you don't know, otherwise only use the documents we have. 
Okay, that's good. Cool. So what, um, aside from the application that you built or you're going to do from work, what other exciting things you've seen around Gen AI that, you, that interest you at the moment? Yeah, Whether I think... Whether it's AI, what your AI will get any... Copilot Studio is a really powerful one for non-developers. So if you're not a traditional app dev, uh, it gets you, I would say, especially like chat with your data, right? Uh, being able to connect to external data sources and drop it into different things. They have a bunch of integrators out there like Teams, Slack, any of those. Uh, it's really exciting because then people with low code, no code skill sets can jump in and build these chat bots that could potentially help their companies out. Okay, yeah, that's good. So, in your opinion, so I just want to ask, what do you think AI would help you to do in the future? So, is a general opinion? Yeah, I That's think over time, I think it'll help people be more efficient in the roles they're doing. I don't think we're at the point where it's really going to replace people. I think it's just going to help people be more efficient, and then. Uh, hopefully then move people closer to the problems they're solving, right? Like instead of writing as much boilerplate, I can ask GitHub Copilot to do that for me. Instead of spending time creating a PowerPoint, I can ask Office 365 Copilot to create a pretty PowerPoint for me. And then I can focus on the job I was brought in to do, right? I can help write code. I can help solve business problems and then the things that are maybe less important, but still time consuming, I can get an assistant yeah. of AI to help me, you know, create it and get going there. Yeah. Is there any particular trend do you see that's coming up in the field of AI or in general? I think some people got really excited and I feel like AI kind of got overhyped i think we saw this in a lot of other fields too like the internet and um, other technology i think blockchain had a huge hype wheel too uh, so did especially with like nfts or non-fungible tokens when they were like selling art for crazy amounts of money uh bitcoin's another one like a lot of these technologies have super big hype cycles yeah i feel like we're waiting for the next big announcement from a big LLM company. Cause I feel uh, if you look, I think Nvidia's stock is down or dropped a ton lately. Uh, I think the hype is kind of subsiding and companies are now taking a more critical look and actually investigating of like, will AI drastically change what I do? And I think the answer right now is AI might make your workers, I don't know, say like five or 10% more productive but it's not going to make it so you're now, you know, a one man company making $3 trillion. Yeah. It's not anywhere near there. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not going to replace us human. It's still going to be there anyway. Yeah, I think the phrase I keep hearing is you won't be replaced by AI. You might get replaced by a human using AI. So, yeah. So, what? Tools. So, so this episode is coming to a close. So what other advice would you give people when starting with Pulumi or AI in general? Uh, with Pulumi, I would say, I think both. Just start building. Uh, you don't have to fill out a thing for Microsoft anymore to actually get access to Azure OpenAI. So just start building. See what it costs to ask a question. Learn how to index your data. Uh, there's a lot of quick starts from Microsoft on how to get going specifically with chatting with your data. Uh, there's a lot of services in Azure to make that a super slick and seamless process. So I'd say get started. Same with Pulumi. Start building. If you want to learn about DevOps, if you want to learn about pipelines, publish your own website. Uh, I have a, a silly blog that was a Gatsby blog. Uh, that's how I got started into more infrastructure as code and pipelines. I just you know, started building something and then go from there. Uh, find the pieces you like, find the pieces you don't. And then, yeah, that's how you learn other concepts and other things. I'm a very uh, practical person. I'd rather learn with my hands dirty than uh, from a textbook if I can help it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all by learning by doing. So, is there any other advice do you would like to give to anyone? Uh, one thing that's really good if you're looking for like an artificial deadline, I would say try to get a talk accepted at a user group. So try to do something similar to this, write a 30 minute hour talk about some concept and then go learn it. Uh, I guarantee you some people might know it better than you, but for the most part, uh, communities like that are very nice and helpful and they'll help you out or you can present it to them and learn some new stuff and network and then they can if you hit any yeah. roadblocks just say like i couldn't figure out x and somebody in the crowd might be like have you tried this or i had the same issue here's how i solved it so yeah just go yeah. and share speaking what you're learning community, you speaking of community you're quite involved in a community alec so can you tell us any of your community involvement yeah, I host a few user groups here in the States. Uh, we are doing a AI workshop October 17th. It's going to kick off 3 p.m. Central Time in the U.S., but it's hybrid. So if you search Iowa Microsoft Azure user group on Meetup or follow me on LinkedIn, I'll be posting about it. I also run a weekly podcast uh, that you've been on that uh, called Azure Cloud Talks, where we talk to other MVPs, other people in the community about technology things, about how they got into their career, and just anything that might be irking them at that any point in time, just to show, you know, we all get frustrated, we all get past it. It's just part of life, part of growing. Yeah. Okay, so before we close the episode, we would always like to know a bit more about the yeah, yourself. So are you going to any, are you doing any events or going to any conference? Uh, I don't think I have anything right now. It's kind of a talk preparation season. So I'm writing some, you know, submissions yeah. for uh, next year's conference speaking. Uh, but yeah, nothing crazy in the books right now. Just looking forward to next year and seeing the next conference season spin up. Okay. Any any particular conference that you're looking forward to next year? Uh, I always have a good time at uh, KCDC, so the Kansas City Developers Conference. Yeah. That one's always a blast. Uh, Microsoft Build has been quite a bit of fun the last couple of years I've gone to. Uh, trying to think of what else. Heartland Developers Conference here in Omaha is a thing that's been going on for a while. It's it's fun. It's just down the road for me. So. I don't have to travel very far for that one, which is nice. But yeah, those are all fun conferences that I enjoy. Yeah, I heard that, AC, I heard that KCDC is, is quite popular developer conference as well. It's, it's quite hard to get into as well. You have to know they, someone that know someone. I forget what it was, but I think there was one track. I think it was the non-technical track. You statistically, it was about the same as forget it what it was it was some crazy stat you're more likely to be struck by lightning to get in or something like that because they had like an insane amount of submissions and they took like 30 of them yeah. it, it's a little bit easier if you I do a technical track but not much <laughs> you probably got more chance when you do like a ama or group group chats about something yeah, I know uh, my co-host right, for my podcast. Or... Yeah, Brian Gorman seems to always get one in. So he's a good person to emulate. Uh, he's an MCT and MVP and runs my podcast with me. He, I think the last two years he's gotten in. Okay. Nice. Okay, now I... Uh, thanks. Uh, where can people get into... West where can people get in touch with you? The best place if you want to advise or anything? Yeah, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, if you just go to linkedin.com slash, I think I'm at alec13355. So A-L-E-C-13355. Uh, I'm there. I have my LinkedIn learning course there. If you want to learn a little bit more about AI or if you just want to follow anything else I'm doing, I typically post on there. Okay, what course is that? Is that the AI course or? Yeah, it's a course over Gen AI. So 
we cover specifically the AI 102 exam, the Gen AI portion. So if you want to learn more about AI, you can sit, learn a little bit more from me. And uh, yeah, it's on LinkedIn Learning. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thanks for coming on this episode, Alec. And in a few weeks, it can be on social media. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me.